I request Dr. Pratibha Narang and Dr. Renu Bharadwaj to come on dais and chair the session. Dr. Pratibha Narang was ex-professor, ex-dean, and ex-director at Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Varda. Dr. Renu Bharadwaj was ex-professor, ex-dean, and past president of IMM. Now I request Dr. Vidya Arjun Vadkar to introduce Dr. Vinod Sakaria. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I welcome Dr. Vinod Skaria. Please come on the dais, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, I am very much privileged to introduce Dr. Vinod Skaria. He is a MBBS PhD, is a clinician as well as princi principal scientist at CSIR Institute of Delhi. He has a research interest in understanding of vertebrate genomics and genomic variations. His research contribution to India in diagnosis and screening of genetic diseases. He is a part of many collaborative whole genome sequencing projects of India. He has contributed to genetic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 during COVID pandemic. He has 180 publications in various international journals and two books to his credit. He is a recipient of Young Scientist Award in his institute. He has a patent of human microRNA targets in HIV genome. I welcome, sir. Thank you. Please uh, start your session. Thank you. For the nice introduction, and thank you, Professor Karikarte, for the invitation and uh, organizing this fantastic uh, meeting. Over the next 30 odd minutes, uh, I will give you uh, a history of four viruses over uh, almost a decade's time. Um, well, uh, everybody in microbiology pretty much know who this is. This is Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, and what he invented was this handheld uh, instrument, what we today call the microscope. Now, microscope is central to everything that you do in microbiology, and in fact, everything uh, and everybody in microbiology uh, goes through looking at organisms under a microscope, but of course not this microscope, but a variety of different kinds of microscopes depending upon the organisms that you have and the organisms that you can observe under each of them because they vary quite widely in the resolutions. But the major problem, therefore, in, in clinical microbiology is the fact that it is heavily dependent upon a priori information. In other words, a, a, a clinician in the clinic cannot really send you a sample and ask you what really is this, right? unless you actually tell the microbiologist that this is the kind of organisms that I suspect, this is the site from which I retrieve the sample, and therefore this is what I need to look at. And of course that picture in here for, is for the residents. Uh, if you can identify uh, what medium and what organism is it, um, there's something for you. Uh, and that's also because the, the, the methods of isolating organisms are also quite very stringent. So you need to have very specific media to isolate very specific organisms. And therefore, the, the entire science of microbiology is largely, or has been largely, uh, phenotypic and much less molecular. Now, what we all know from, of course, many other speakers out there, is that all organisms that we see around us has a genome, and the genome is either DNA or RNA. And by virtue of the sequenceability of nucleotides, DNA or RNA, you could today sequence the organism and not even really go through culture sensitivity or culture and isolation or even observation under the microscope. You can actually go back and figure out what is in there in the DNA and RNA. And that is thankful to the advances in technology that has largely happened over the last one decade. Uh, and of course, that is consequent to the increase in throughput, the reduction in cost, and of course, uh, a, a lot of other things that happened across the world, not just in India, but also across the world, which made this all possible, what we today call as next generation sequencing. So what has really changed in the last one decade is from looking under the microscope after isolating an organism, for example, a virus uh, out of an outbreak would have taken months, if not years, before they could be isolated in a particular uh, cell line. 
and be observed under an electron microscope to essentially characterize to say that, okay, this is what virus that really caused this infection. Today, you don't really need to go through this uh, complicated process. You can actually take the sample, sequence, and identify what's in there. Not just identify the organism, but also uh, be able to look at the whole genome of the organism to, to make very informative guesses about what's really happening in there. So this is from around a decade, from 2012, uh, where we worked on an interesting hypothesis called uh, hologenome sequencing. And uh, sitting through the entire day, what I also realized is that while Rosenberg and Rosenberg call this word hologenome, which essentially is a sum total of genetic information of the host and the microbiota, right? If you really look out in that corner, uh, sometime in 1977, uh, whoever founded the Indian Association for Medical Microbiologists have actually conceptualized that you could have the host and the microbe, and of course the DNA of the host put together, and you could probably sequence in the future to identify what microbes are in there. And of course, you don't find a microscope in there. Um, well, one of the first applications of this is uh, uh, in, in animal disease, which happened in 2012. Uh, this is shrimp, uh, the shrimp that we eat. And there was a virus disease called the white spot syndrome of the shrimp, which used to infect uh, shrimp farms in and across the country. And that was essentially causing a huge loss to the exchequer and of course exports because a lot of shrimp in the country is exported out to, to global economies. And the real problem was that while there was a PCR uh, assay for the shrimp that, or the shrimp virus that is available at that point of time, this PCR assay stopped working. So we went ahead and actually did this, what we today call as shotgun metagenome sequencing. We could take the shrimp, grind, them, grind it up and actually sequence uh, the DNA. And using smart computational tools, without even a reference genome, be able to identify what is in there. Uh, so you could take these nodes, which comprise what is the shrimp, the bigger peak out there is essentially the human, and be able to completely assemble the genome of the virus. And what we figured out was this virus has essentially five major deletions, and some of these deletions overlap the PCR primers. So we essentially know why the PCR primers did not work. And more importantly, with the, with the whole genome sequence of the virus, today we know where to design the new primers where there are no deletions. And this was uh, largely done in collaboration with Dr. Shahul Hamid, who, who runs uh, uh, one of the OIE centers for shrimp viruses in, in Tamil Nadu. Now fast forward into 2020, we know what happened, and uh, uh, you have heard about this, so I'll, I'll del not delve deeper into this. Uh, but what we need to keep in mind is that every organism around us, including ourselves, uh, uh, evolve, and that evolution is by accumulating genetic mutations. The only difference between us and viruses is that there is a different, in, different speed in which you can accumulate genetic mutations. So RNA viruses largely accumulate mutations much faster compared to DNA viruses, but of course there are exceptions to this, and uh, those are the exceptions I'm probably going to come back in, in, in the future slides. So one of the applications of looking at these mutations, and many of the, in, in almost all cases, the mutations are at a constant rate for a given organism. You can essentially draw a, a, a sort of a lineage map for each of the viruses and each of the sets of mutations out there. So given, say, for example, six mutations, you could accumulate these mutations one over another over a specific period of time. And if you really know what the mutation rate of the organism is, then you can essentially compute or rather back calculate uh, at what point in time did a particular strain or a particular set of mutations emerge. And of course, if you put together genomes with very similar mutations, you can cluster them in a phylogenetic tree, and that's what we call as lineages or, or variants uh, for that matter. And more importantly, if you know the mutation rate of the organism, and if you also know the lineages and the components of that particular lineage, you can pre-compute uh, to what we call as a most recent common ancestor, or at that point in time when the virus originated. Now this is really, really very important because it will exactly tell you at what point in time did the particular virus come into a particular population, and that is really important in public health uh, relevance. So to give an example, uh, this is what was done uh, early in the pandemic in US, where uh, there were multiple genomes that were sequenced, and you could put together the mutations and the time uh, of the uh, origin of the uh, introduction to actually figure out that cryptic transmission of the virus did happen even before uh, it was officially recognized uh, uh, by the country. Now, such mutations are also important in to also tracking the future of a particular pathogen. 
Now, as you know, the virus is constantly emerging and that's essentially why you see more and more genetic variants. And these genetic variants typically uh, 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 accumulate uh, or, or, the, uh, or the emergent genetic variations typically try to accumulate or optimize for two parameters. One is, of course, the transmissibility and the other one is the immune escape. And, and to, be, uh, to be frank, this is the only way the virus can actually continue transmitting because if it cannot ev evade pre-existing immunity in an individual, it, it will stop transmitting and that's pretty much the end of the virus. So you could have informatics tools today and databases, and two of them are, are in here, which can allow you to actually uh, look at evidence that's already in there, look at an emerging variant that is coming up from the sequencing expedition, and be able to put them into this map and try to say, what is it really trying to do? Is it trying to evade more antibodies, or is it trying to uh, optimize itself for its transmission, or in some cases, both? And eventually in the future, it, it will have to get into a point where it has optimized for both and pretty much no more uh, possibility to optimize it further. And that is probably when we would see an end of this pand uh, COVID pandemic. And of course, there are multiple variety of tools and resources that would make such computation possible. I'm not delve deep in this bit. Um, but fast forward into 2022, of course, the COVID is uh, pretty much, uh, I would say, endemic. But we have newer pathogens and newer challenges uh, that we come across. In 2022, of course, uh, it's important because we had the 2022 outbreak of monkeypox, which is otherwise an endemic virus in Africa, but now spread across 90 odd countries with over 50,000 50, cases and over 19 reported deaths. And much later in 2022, uh, in India, we have another pox virus, but of course not a human pox virus, but a pox virus in the cattle, what we call as a lumpy skin disease of the cattle, which over the last three months has caused more than 3 million infections in cattle and over 80,000 deaths, uh, mostly in Gujarat and, uh, uh, and Rajasthan, but also today uh, uh, reaching Maharashtra. Now, of course, we had the fortune to uh, look around the genomic data of monkeypox. Uh, we didn't sequence any of this data. This is available in public domain. And what we noticed was we have, uh, apart from the large cluster that you see in here, uh, which is the outbreak that largely happened in Europe, we have a much smaller cluster in here, uh, as you see here, the small dots out here. And uh, all the Indian genomes that we know today of monkeypox fell into this small cluster and not that large cluster. So we were curious about what this cluster is. We did find out that this cluster is largely composed of genomes from India and Thailand, uh, and, and much recently uh, uh, from Nigeria. And what we also realized that this is a much smaller and cryptic cluster not, uh, not related to the large outbreak that had happened across Europe, but nevertheless, uh, given the time of origin, this had been there for almost a year, and the closest genome to this was essentially sequenced from the United States of America. So in other words, uh, heightened surveillance and heightened uh, awareness in the public, not just in public among clinicians, would allow us to diagnose otherwise cryptic diseases and be able to sequence them and sequencing can allow us to actually understand that many of these viruses have been there and spreading across the globe in the past uh, in, in a pretty much uh, cryptic way. And of course, this particular cluster is characterized by around 16 uh, unique genetic variations. Uh, I'll not delve deep into it, but now we have more genomes from uh, in this cluster, more genomes from India, more genomes from Thailand, and uh, some more genomes from the United States, which today can define this particular cluster as three different, uh, three distinct clusters, uh, possibly uh, with uh, quite distinct uh, methods of spread. Now, why I said we have been talking about monkeypox virus, which is essentially an orthopox virus, which is very close to uh, the rabbit pox, uh, the variola, and the cowpox uh, viruses. And a much similar virus is the capri pox virus, which encompasses the goat pox, the sheep pox, and the lumpy skin disease. And this largely affects uh, the cattle and, 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 and animals. And of course, we have an outbreak, an ongoing outbreak, quite large outbreak of uh, uh, lumpy pox, uh, lumpy skin disease virus in, in India. This was a largely endemic virus in Africa, first uh, discovered in Zambia in 1929. And until 2015, this is largely confined to Africa, and only after 2015, it had its uh, foray into, uh, into the Middle East, uh, into Central Asia, and much recently into Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, so this uh, sort of uh, suggests how this disease has been spreading out of Africa into uh, pretty much uh, entire Asia and Southeast Asia. 
Now, over the last three months, the first case uh, was uh, identified in Gujarat, and over the last three months, this has uh, resulted in over 3 million uh, infections and 80,000 cattle deaths officially reported, with an uh, average mortality of around 4 to 5 percentage. Now, what we could do is to essentially uh, recapitulate what we learned from uh, all this pandemic. Uh, you could, uh, we could obtain samples uh, in collaboration with the State Disease Diagnostic Center in Rajasthan. We performed a whole genome shotgun sequencing. And from the shotgun sequencing, we could actually isolate the virus, assemble the virus quite effectively. Six genomes could be isolated. And we found was that the six genomes form a very distinct cluster with no similarity between the previous viruses isolated in India or the previous isolate, uh, isolates uh, from across Asia. So this particular cluster of virus is uh, cataloged by around 171 genetic mutations, uh, around uh, 36 of which are non-synonymous and present exclusively in this particular cluster of virus. So to summarize, we have multiple different applications for genomics and genomic surveillance. Of course, for early identification, uh, the origin of the pandemic, health interventions, you've heard about this in, in the previous talks. You could look at tracing of the spread, uh, monitor the evolution and track the prevalence. You have it uh, here from the previous speakers. But of course, much more important to analyze this further is to be able to share this data so that the public and, and, and learned people in the public could actually analyze and make quite favorable interpretations. And to enable this, of course, you need to have computational tools. And this is one of the automated computational tools that was being developed in the lab, where uh, you, could, you could use this computational approach or a, or, or a box where you could use any next generation sequencing data for any viral outbreaks and be able to analyze without having to go to the nut and bolts of bioinformatics. This is freely available. It can take a FASTA file or a FASTQ file or a GSAID link and be able to analyze this data in a very systematic way and provide reports so that you can make informed decisions. And of course, the future is not just genomics, but also integrating genomics with a lot of other epidemiology information. And many of this information today is available in digital form. Uh, one of the groups uh, that we have been uh, looking at is uh, compiling data on uh, the avian influenza, which follows essentially uh, the climatic patterns and, uh, of course, the bird flyways. And you could track the origin of the bird flyway over the season and, of course, also look at reports emanating from those regions for the bird flu virus. Thank you very much. And before that, let me acknowledge a lot of people who made this possible, including people in our lab, uh, Dr. Sridhar, who has been a quite consistent collaborator over more than a decade and a half, uh, fantastic set of clinical collaborators from across the country, and funding from multiple sources, including CSIR, the Maharashtra state government, many other state governments, and the WHO. Thank you very much. an excellent talk, making such a difficult subject easy to comprehend. You have taken us right from Antimon Leon Hawk, right up to cultures, in vitro cultures, and then up to genomics and metagenomics, and then bioinformatics, and uh, informing us how important this is going to be for the future. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one, more, one uh, small uh, um, clarification. Do you think that, I mean, is anybody going, do you think this lumpy virus is going to mutate and jump into humans? Yeah, so um, pox viruses are very uh, host specific. Uh, typically, they don't really cross the host unless you have very large deletions in the genome. Um, and it has not happened very often in the past that uh, the, the pox viruses have shifted host. Monkeypox is one example where it has shifted from an animal uh, yes. uh, origin to a human infection. Uh, lumpy pox, uh, we have never had except one case report out of Egypt where it has actually uh, been found in an individual who was closely yeah. related to the animals. Now, we don't really know whether it will, uh, it will uh, jump the host, but genomic surveillance is very important to essentially see whether there are deletions uh, in the genome which actually allows that to happen. And typically, the pox viruses delete specific genes so that they can jump across a host barrier. Yes. Because, uh, and that is why I think surveillance is very, very important. Absolutely. That's one very good example to show how Absolutely. surveillance is important. So thank you very much thank for very much. a very nice lecture. And I also thank the organizers Hello. for giving me this opportunity uh, and uh, letting me share the dice with one of my very good, best, good friend, Dr. Renu Bhardwaj.
And I do not know whether I'll get the platform again, so I want to congratulate Dr. Kare Karta and his team at BJ Medical College for uh, excellent work during the COVID and his collaborators everywhere. And uh, thank you very much once again to giving us this opportunity. Uh, sir, I Any had a question. Questions from the audience? We didn't give the audience a chance. Yeah. Anybody wanted to ask anything? Yes, ma'am. Actually, yeah. I had a question, sir, discussed about the faster format and the fast queue format. Usually, what we get from the output from the machine is the faster format. So, uh, like uh, we being a clinical microbiologist, uh, it is difficult for us to compare uh, the genomic data which is available on the net. So, could you just uh, elaborate a little bit in within the time? next generation sequencer is a faster file with qualities and that's what is called a fast queue file and the fast queue files are essentially raw data it is not assembled it is just out of the sequencer and now once you take the fast queue files and assemble it either use uh, reference based assembly when you know the, what the reference genome is or you do a de novo assembly when you don't really know what the virus is or what the organism is then you could essentially construct the genome of the organism which is essentially representative in a FASTA file, which doesn't have qualities, but necessarily is the sequence of the genome, right? Now, depending upon the comparisons that you do, you can, you can take both of it, right? Uh, like, for example, if you want to look at the difference between your sequencing expedition and a particular reference genome, the reference genome is typically available in a FASTA format, or a given variant of the virus available in a FASTA format, you could do these comparisons automatically. And to, to, to make this easy is what we have created the GenePy box, where you could, for example, download a GSAID sequence, you could run your experiment from your sequencer, and now be able to compare both of them to see what is the difference between them. Thank Just you. one question, Dr. Min. During monkeypox, there were some isolated cases which are not related to the African continent at all. Mm -hmm. Was there any shift in, any difference in their mutations? Or did they come to you, or are you aware of it? Right. So. Uh, the monkeypox uh, outbreaks are largely, in, in, in the 2022 outbreak, is largely two different clusters, as I said. One of the clusters came out of a European super spreader event, which happened in May, which largely spread in uh, the gay bisexual community and spread across the world quite very fast. Now, the cluster of the virus essentially is uh, out of an uh, ancestral uh, African uh, strain, uh, which today we now know as a B1 uh, sort of cluster. Now, the other cryptic isolate is also out of uh, an African ancestral isolate, but nevertheless have mutated quite distinctly different from each other, uh, and, uh, and of course has spread uh, over time. Well, even in India, there were some cases where people who had never been to Africa or had no t contact with people in Africa, right. and yet they had monkeypox, no? Right, absolutely. So um, at least all the cases in India do not have uh, any travel history to Africa, mm -hmm. nor have any travel history to any of the European countries which had that uh, super spreader event. Uh, now that is very interesting because all the genomes that we today know out of India largely fall in the cryptic cluster and we don't have yet, uh, of course we don't have too many genomes to compare, but of the genomes that we could compare, uh, there are no genomes out of India which map to the B1 supercluster, which is out of Af uh, out of uh, the European super spreader event. Now, how did this intermediate spread happen over the last one year? We clearly do not know. At least some of them are travelers out of the United uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, at least the ones in Kerala. But uh, for the, the cases in Delhi, they do not have a travel case. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I request Chairperson Dr. Renu Bharadwaj and Dr. Pratibha Naran to felicitate Dr. Sakaria. Pooja will felicitate Dr. Pratibha Narang. Dr. Bhagyashree will felicitate
felicitate Dr. Renu Bharatwaj. Dr. Vaishali, good afternoon to all. May I invite our next speaker, Dr. Manoj Vyas, to join us on the dais? Yes. I, take I take great pleasure in introducing Dr. Manoj Vyas, manager in application scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific. He will enlighten us on 16 as metagenomics and SARS CoV 2 sequencing with iron torrent technology. Over to you, Dr. Vyas. Take your lecture regarding 16S metagenomics and SARS CoV 2 genome sequencing on iron torrent technology. So, I am representing here Thermo Fisher Scientific. We are the leading manufacturer for a lot of scientific instruments, kits, and all. So, before we move to our technical part, first we tell who we are. Interruption. Now we are back. So, before moving ahead, I will take you through what Thermo Fisher and what we are doing and who we are. So Thermo Fisher is a US based company. We have more than 75,000 employees worldwide. India, we have more than 2,000 employees. We have a scientist community, more than 5,700 employees worldwide and investment in R&D is about 1 billion. So we are world leader in serving science. I think every one of you having one of our instrument in your lab from PCR to RT-PCR, diagnostic kits, ATION, NGS, capillary sequencing. As you all are aware that we are the ones on whose instrument that whole genome project or human genome project had done, that is a capillary sequencer. So we not go much in that corporate slides. So we, we are in the next generation sequencing, liquid biopsy, assay development, biomarkers, a lot of other things we do. So we directly take you to our topics of 16x metagenomics. So this slide will tell you about the introduction of metagenomics in 16s. So first thing that why we do metagenomics, why we do 16s, and why we are doing microbial profiling. So as you all know that metagenomics we used to do for a characterization of the many genes in a microbial population, and 16s you have to do in a mixed microbial population, and if you have to do microbial profiling, you have to do a targeted sequencing for a bacterial typing research. So where we can apply 16S based sequencing research, it is microbial profiling. If you have a gut microbiome for, from genomic DNA, so the protocol or the workflow will be like that, amplify your 16S region, regions, and then sequence and do the diversity assessment through our dedicated pipelines for microbial profiling. And if you have an environmental samples, then you have to go for a microbial identification where you should isolate the DNA from the environmental sample and then you amplify your 16S regions sequence and then use our dedicated pipelines for bacterial identification. So the difference between both of them, the first one required the from microbial mixtures and the second one, you require a pure, pure microbial cultures that are pooled from different sources. So what is our 16S metagenomics solution? So we have a dedicated kit, the 16S metagenomics region, which cover from V1 to V8 regions in two primer pools. So this is a multi-target approach, provide broad coverage across 16S V regions. It's not like that your regular Amplicon approach where you use the primers to cover a two regions. Here we are covering a whole variable regions. This is divided into two pools and workflow is very easy, which you can do in a two days from sample to results with the analysis part. So till day, what is the traditional approach we are using for 16S metagenomics? That conserved gene present in all bacteria, well-established marker for identifying, classifying microbes. So the question comes why we are using a next generation sequencing for 16S profiling. The current solutions often require pure cultures. Lake of bioinformatics is there. 
and lake curated databases is there. So which take a lot of time. So our solutions, we have a curated databases, dedicated pipeline, dedicated primer pools, which save you a lot of time. We also have a dedicated database called MicroSeq ID database, where you can you put your data and you get your desired results. So this is about our 16S metagenomics kit. So we have a dedicated software called Iron Reporter software, which provides a complete, fast, culture-free, and affordable research solution that takes you from sample to population composition in a very short period of time. So our primers are designed, as I'm showing you on a screen, that V2, V3, V4, V6, V7, V8, V9. So you're covering everything. You're not going to miss any of your reasons. The primers which are designed is a flexible primers as a two separate pools. If you are interested for a specific reason, suppose V2 to V4 reason, you just have to use a single pool. If you are interested for a other reason, you have to use a other pool. So it gives you the flexibility. It, you, it's not like that you have to run a whole primer pools to detect your microbial population. So as I say earlier, the sample to result in less than two days. It's a trunky, you can say a protocol where you can get a isolation kits from Thermo Fisher. You get a 16S kit from Thermo Fisher. We have a dedicated system for it that called ION. Gene Studio Plus and Gene Studio Prime systems are there, which give you flexibility to use chips also as per your choice. On that we discuss later. So this slide will tell you how many samples you can pull on a particular type of a chip. Suppose if you are using a 520 chip, your output is about four to six million. You can pull, if you are looking for a blood microbiome, you can pull a 96 samples on a 520 chip. A lot of samples going to complete in a small frame of time. If you have a more number of sample, if you have to screen a particular type of a micro, a large number of population, you can pull 384 samples on a 530 chip. And if you have an environmental sample, where data requirement is more, you can also run that samples on a 530 chips. And if you have a gut microbiome, you can run one to 20 samples on a 520 chip, which is a huge demand in the market. Nowadays, people are using a gut microbiome kits for a clinical applications also. So this is the kit infrastructure, how it looks. It comes in the two sets, the B2 to V4 and V8, and another set have V3 to V6 and 7 and 9. And there is a master mix, which is an environmental master mix, which take care of the all PCR-based business. So we have a buffers included in the kit. As I told, it's a con complete package. We also have a control DNA as which we use as a positive reference. And this slide will tell you how our primer design looks like. As you say, we have uh, overlapping regions. So V2 to V4 in covered in a one region, and V5 to V9 is covered in another region. So it gives you a broad coverage. So you're going to get a complete range of 400 base pair sequence via metagenomics kit. So as I told that our master mix is a specific design for this kit, it is able to tolerate high level of PCR inhibitors from soil, tissue, food, cell culture, etc. So these are our curated databases which we use for our micro uh, analysis. These are MicroSeq ID database and Green Gene database. So these all features are available in the database which makes your life easy and you're getting a perfect results. So all sequence quality, length, annotation, phylogeny, taxonomy updates taken care by the software. And we have a dedicated 16S data resource where 1.2 million sequences already available in the database. This is a Thermo Fisher specific databases. And this is our iron reporter software, which is available for metagenomics, not only metagenomics, also for other cancer, SARS-CoV-2 application, we use the same software where we have a features for MicroSeq ID and Green Gene Database. And you see that if it is a, any species level identification is there, you, it is highlighted by the software in the green. So we also improve our 16 years workflow continuously. That ion reporter software is upgraded to 5.0. That 16 years workflow harnessing algorithm for the 
QIME software and primer specific result you can get. It's not like that you run as a pool. So you have to rely on a whole pool. You can get a results for your specific primer, suppose for V2, V4, V6, V8. Any results you can get by this software, as it is shown in the image. So before moving to SARS-CoV-2 SARS sequencing, I want to show you a video of our newly launched instrument called Genexus. Analysis, providing you a fast and hands-off next generation Sequencer automates library and template prep, sequencing, and analysis, providing you a fast and hands-off next-generation sequencing workflow. Performing an NGS run has never been so easy and can be done with minimal hands-on time. All reagents and buffers arrive pre-filled for easy loading and manufactured at a facility registered with FDA and ISO 13485 certified. Simply prepare your nucleic acid sample and select your desired protocol to start a run. The vision system on board the instrument verifies consumable placement and provides real-time alerts of any errors through automated barcode scanning. Follow the step-by-step -step instructions on the touchscreen to add the consumables. Alternatively, add them at your own pace and allow the vision system to detect any errors as you go. Let's begin. Place the red ion torrent Genexus Strip 1 in the area marked with a red blinking light. When the consumables are added correctly, the area will turn grey. Add strips 1 through 4, which are color-coded for easy pairing to the corresponding colored spot. Place the pipette tip racks, new 96 well plates, sample plate, primer pool tubes, sequencing chip and coupler, and the barcode plate into the appropriate areas as instructed by the screen. Continue to follow the instructions on the screen to load the sequencing reagents and consumables. Place the pre-filled bottles and cartridge. That completes the setup. Now you can walk away and come back when the run is complete to review results and generate report. Learn more at thermofisher.com slash genexus. So thank you for watching the video. Now the important point is that why I show this video. So this is the instrument we launched around a year back and extensively used by a lot of laboratories for a SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. Even in Pune, we have some installations available. And as you see, it's a single touch instrument where you not to do any bench work. You just have to isolate your RNA or DNA and give to the instrument. In current scenario, as we want to deliver the results, everybody is saying 24 hours, 48 hours and all. This machine is able to give you SARS-CoV result in less than 20 hours with all the lineage, all the coverage analysis, everything, and it even helps you to submit your data till the GZ. The data comes in the format, which you can submit directly to the GZ. So I will take you through that our panel design and all. For SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, we have two types of panel. One is SARS-CoV-2 research panel. Another is SARS-CoV-2 inside panel. So that panel is divided again two pools. It is a targeted panel, which covers the whole SARS-CoV-2 genome. It is having around 247 unique primer pairs, amplicons, and having a coverage more than 99% for SARS-CoV-2 genome. So Thermo Fisher is the one who done the sequencing in NIV in May 2020 for 96 SARS-CoV-2 genome samples on iron torrent technology. I don't have an exact number, but more than 20,000 uh, sequences submitted on our platform in India, in GZ. Many big institutes having this platform. NIV is the one. SMS Jaipur, Doon Medical College. They are the ones who submit lot of sequences in the GZ. Many private players are doing sequencing for the other countries also on this platform. And 
we are regularly updating our pipelines according to the coming mutations for this panel. So if you are going to prepare, so we have two options. You can use Genius Studio Instrument and Chef as well as Genexus. Genius Studio Instrument gives you the flexibility to run at least 160 samples in a day. So you're going to get your results in 48 hours. And if you have to report samples early, you can report 16 samples in less than 20 hours. So we have both the solutions with us. As you're able to see on a screen, the hands-on time for target amplification is two hours and 15 minutes is required to prepare libraries on Chef Instrument and templating hands-on time is very less. You have to sit with the analysis part. So these instrument gives you a lot of time to do the analysis part instead of doing the bench bar. So runtime of our instrument Gene Studio S5 is 2.5 hours for sequencing and GeneXus instrument have a runtime of 20 hours with library preparation, templating, sequencing, analysis, everything is covered. If you see here, our sample requirement is only 1 to 10 nanogram of total RNA. The workflow will be like that. You just have to run your sample on qPCR. On the basis of your CT values, we do the amplification, target amplification. Once the library is done, we quantify the libraries either by the help of qPCR or a qubit. Then we go for a template preparation, run sequence, and analyze the data. We have a dedicated pipe plugins available in our software Iron Reporter for a SARS-CoV-2 plugin package. So currently we have three systems is available that suits to your lab. The, there is no big difference in these instruments, only the difference is the analysis time or a run time. The number one, the Genie Studio S5 is a basic instrument. It takes a little more time in analysis. Second one is S5 Plus, which takes a half time of the first instrument. It takes around eight hours for analysis. And Genie Studio S5, S5 Prime is very fast because as you see, it having a standalone server with the instrument. You also have a flexibility to run different type of samples on the chip as per your requirement. We have a chips from 510 to 550. 550 chip is capable to run 130 samples in a go on a one chip. You can run two chips simultaneously on this instrument. So the output of the different chips are now on your screen, 510 chips is available to give you two to three million of reads. 520 chip is available to give you four to six million. And if you go higher, the 550 chip is able to give you 100 to 130 million of reads. These chips are capable to run 200 to 600 base pair of chemistry. 520 and 530 chips able to run 200, 400, 600 base pair of chemistry. 540 and 540 chips are able to run 200 base pair of chemistry. So this is our GenXus system as you saw in the video. It having a single day turnaround time. It's everything is automated. Their sample extraction also done by the instrument. Even you not to isolate the system. It has come with the GenXus purification system. The flexibility is there. You can run a one sample, you can run a eight samples, or you can run 16 samples for SARS-CoV-2. It is a FDA and ISO 134-85 certified instrument. This is developed in those facilities where FDA and I ISO 134-85 certified. We are in the process of developing some assays, which is FDA approved. This instrument majorly used by the oncology labs where you want a targeted sequencing result in less than 16 hours. So as you see, the turnaround time for a single lane run, there is a chip is divided again a four lanes. You can use a each lane as per your use. Suppose in one lane you want to run a BRCA cancer, in next, next lane you can run a myeloid. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. For this instrument basically used for the clinical applications. So as for SARS-CoV-2, it gives you the flexibility to run 16 samples in single lane and up to 32 samples in two lanes. And it takes a less than a 20 hours for give you sample to result. So as I tell you earlier, that we have a complete package. It help you to submit your data till the G said. We have all the plugins involved in our software, which help you to generate the all consensus, everything done by the software. You just have to submit your data to the G set. So as someone asked here that how we are going to see the FASTA files and how we are to submit. 
The software also gives you the all lineage. Everything come on the screen. It will say you from which place the variant is coming. It is delta, alpha, gamma, whatever is there. It is should tell you by the software. So as I say that it is a very fast instrument which is turned around around 24 hours and it's accurate and rapid. As I say, we are developing this instrument as a facility is approved by the FDA. So I'm not going again back in this slide. The last, this instrument always help you to give a report in a self-explanatory mode which not require any interpretation. You just have to go through the report and you can report to the patients. So everything done by, so we have a different options. All these options is available if you have a lot of manpower with you. If you want only a one single point touch instrument, you can go for a Genexus instrument. Thank you, this is from Thermo Fisher side. If you have the contacts, you can contact me or my colleagues, which are available in the booth area. If any questions, welcome. ask whether uh, you do that uh, 16 egg as uh, genome sequencing um, how do uh, how do you get the report like uh, all the varial, uh, various microbes uh, forming that microbiome is does it come bacteria wise and phylogenetic but with different uh, primers you get different sets of microbes yeah yeah ma'am and there are options are available. You want to go with the primer wise, or you want to go with the bacteria wise, or you want to go with the gene ID wise. Okay. So a lot of options available in the software. Okay. So you can get the report as you want. So gut and lung microbiome and all, they are, you have different uh, sets. Data sets are available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Now I request Dr. Sushma to felicitate Dr. Vyas. Sir, sir please be on the dais. Dr. Sushma. Over to Dr. Vaishali to continue the next session. Now I welcome Dr. Darshan Rana for next lecture. He is Deputy Manager Medical Affairs, BD Diagnostic. Uh, good evening everyone, sorry for the delay. So uh, uh, the topic for my presentation is uh, Diagnostic uh, MDR-TB upfront, uh, two test versus one test. So uh, basically this is like uh, uh, we are expanding our uh, uh, um, uh, testing potential, the diagnostic testing potential by entering into the molecular field uh, for the detection of faster, faster diagnosis of infectious agent. For this, we are coming up with our BDMAX system. So a BD, as a BD integrated diagnostic solution, we have a wide range of portfolio which range from uh, blood culture and growth, uh, uh, blood culture and growth for patho uh, pathogen identification and antimicrobial anti anti susceptibility. Then we have complete lab automation, uh, uh, automation system known as uh, BD Kestra. Then uh, specimen management collection and transport portfolio. Then a uh, women's health, uh, health and cancer portfolio. Now we have expanded into molecular diagnostics uh, that uh, automate sample extraction, uh, extraction and amplification on the same platform, uh, which I will be covering in the subsequent slides. 
So uh, our uh, portfolio of DD back tag measure is well known, which is used for the liquid culture of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, as I said, we have come up with a BD Max molecular uh, testing uh, platform, which allows extraction, amplification, as well as detection of target nucleic acid using real time polymerase PCR. It's a basically it's a multiplex PCR, which apart from MDR TB, which allows diagnosis, uh, which allows others assess as well, which I'll be uh, covering in subsequent slides. So. Uh, it's a fully ad automated multiplex PCR, uh, uh, which uh, has uh, less than uh, 1.5 minutes hands-on time per sample. Then around 24 patients, uh, uh, 24 testing can be done in a two to three hours average, and uh, almost 96 samples can be tested in a per hour shift. So this enhances performance of the lab, increases the efficiency of the lab, as well as at the same time, the uh, uh, it's versatile because uh, multiple testing that is. Uh, um, uh, Multiple uh, PC, uh, multiple SS can be run on this same platform. So as I said, uh, it's a one assay which allows four results. That is uh, MTB detection, RIF, uh, RIF detection, uh, that is RIF resistance or not, INH resistance or not, as well as INH mutation, that is CAT G and INH APR mutation. So both raw sputum and uh, concentrated sputum can be tested on this uh, assay. Then uh, Nuc nucleic acid extraction is done through a advanced magnetic bead, uh, 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 magnetic bead uh, extraction technology. Then the PCR uh, technology is used for resistance detection. So it's a fully automated workflow uh, which allows extraction and PCR on one go. And uh, uh, like uh, the formula which is used is max load, uh, load and gauge. So what are the uh, goals for the detection for MTBC? There are multi-copy genomic uh, targets of IA6110 and IA1081. Then for RIF, there is RRDR codon coding ratio 507 to 533. Then for INHA promoter gene as well as for uh, uh, isomerase of that is CAT gene, uh, 315 codon is the target. So as for uh, WHO study in 2021, it was reported that incidence of isomerase versus mono resistance is uh, very high although the patient is susceptible to reform tissue. So it was found that uh, in all the, uh, the MDR TB patients, 13.1% of the new cases had isomerase mono resistance, and 17.4% uh, uh, of previous treated ca uh, cases had isomerase mono resistance. Now this is critically significant because the isomerase mono resistance is not detected, which can lead to MDR TB because isomerase uh, resistance is itself the driver of MDR TB. Uh, MDRTB assay is now uh, WHO is endorsed by WHO for diagnosis of TB as well as RIF, of RIF and INH resistance. It is uh, uh, it has uh, included uh, this assay in the moderate complexity as well. Moderate complexity automated match uh, class of molecular diagnosis technology for high diagnostic accuracy for TB testing. So uh, uh, as per the current algorithm, uh, when the patient comes for MDRTB testing, the first sample is taken. And uh, if risk resistance is detected, then the second test is to be done for a uh, first line LPA and uh, DOC measure. So on, with on the first test, there is no INS resistance information. And uh, sometimes on the basis of risk resistance, only the patient is started on the treatment. Uh, that is the patient being assumed that, uh, assumed that it is uh, INS uh, sensitive. So uh, the, uh, when the treatment is started with, uh, on the first line drug, and uh, it eventually uh, leads to uh, the failure, and, uh, as well as it eventually leads to the failure of therapy and increased chances of MDR TB. So if, uh, uh, if, if we include this, uh, if we update this algorithm with the BD Max, so we get the uh, INH uh, resistance upfront. That is both INH and uh, RIF testing can be done in the one test at go, at, and, and we will also get the uh, INH CAG and INH APR mutation. So if the patient is susceptible to both INS and RIF, then uh, no additional test is required. So in, let us assume a case in which the patient is INS mono resistant, uh, uh, that is he is sensitive to reform tissue, but he is uh, resistant to isoniasis, and the patient has active TB. So if uh, with the current uh, uh, modalities which are available for the diagnosis, 
So if the patient is very susceptible, then uh, he will be started, uh, started on the first line therapy, that is acerizide. And uh, this can, uh, if uh, this can, uh, the development of uh, this, uh, so, so the patient is isometric resistant, and it can eventually uh, drive the patient to rip resistance may occur in the patient. Uh, so uh, it can increase the chances of MDRTB in this patient as well, as, as the patient is initially started on the first line treatment. So uh, if we we have a BDMAX, uh, if we use the BDMAX uh, platform upfront, so both isonic acid as well as rifampicin uh, testing uh, would be done, uh, would be included in the first step itself, and uh, the patient uh, will be treated accordingly. If the patient is isonic acid resistant as well, then uh, they will it will be started on rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and levofloxacin uh, for the duration of six months, which is the current uh, recommended guideline. So, uh, so the uh, following this, there is two tests versus one. Uh, we will uh, save on the cost as well as time to results because if the as per current algorithm, uh, if we follow the uh, if uh, MTB is detected and if, uh, if the patient is uh, risk resistant, then 100% of the samples will move to step two for the second step. That is uh, uh, culture as well as uh, LPA for second line injectables and. And uh, and also for isoniazid uh, uh, resistant detection and as well, but uh, with the BDMAX platform, uh, only 14% of the sample will go to step two as uh, the isoniazid will be detected upfront. So uh, this is how uh, the result of uh, BDMAX MDRTB assay will be. With one assay, we'll get the four results. Uh, that is. Uh, MTB detection, uh, isonic acid uh, risk resistance detected or not detected, isonic acid resi uh, resistance detected or not detected. At the same time, we'll get CAD mutation as well as INHA mutation, INHA APM uh, mutation detected. So the clinicians can now determine if the higher low concentration of INHA uh, treatment is possible because uh, sometimes on the basis of INHA mutation, uh, the split uh, INS therapy is given to the patient. So this is the overall sensitivity and specificity as compared to the composite uh, culture plus uh, NAC. The, uh, in the smear positive patient, the sensitivity was more than 98% for both the raw and processed food as well as, uh, and overall for both food and diet it was more than 98%. As well as for smear negative patient, it was, uh, for raw food it was 88% uh, and well as for processed food it was 90% and for both food and it was 89%. While overall sensitivity and specificity was more than 94% for both raw and processed sputum as well as both sputum. Now when we see the per, uh, performance for reef resistance as well as IH resistance, the overall sensitivity and specificity, uh, overall sensitivity for reef resistance was more, uh, 100% in both, uh, both the type of sputum, while uh, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, specificity was 99.5% for raw sputum and 96.8% for the process sputum. And when we see the INH performance, uh, the overall sensitivity was 100% uh, for both the sputum type and for and the specificity was al also 100%. So, the, uh, so we had a good sensitivity and specificity for INH. So this was a study done in this, uh, 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 this technology, sorry. The study in which the technologies were compared, and uh, then uh, it was the BDMAX. It was the LOD was found to be 0.5 colon forming unit per mL, and uh, for RIF INH it's uh, 6 colon forming unit per mL. As compared to other modalities which are available, that is expert MTB RIF and expert MTB RIF Ultra, which has 50 to 165 colon forming unit per mL, and uh, 5 to 25 colon forming unit per mL respectively. So this was other study which was done to uh, the uh, for the epidemiolo epidemiology of isonic acid uh, resistance model, uh, isonic acid uh, resistance mutation and their effect on tuberculosis treatment outcome. So it was found that the CAT G315 mutation confer high level uh, isonic acid resistance and it occurred in 75% of isonic acid resistance strain. And also uh, this CAT G315 mutation is associated with high risk of treatment failure. And uh, 
because of this, there is uh, uh, unfavorable treatment outcome during the first line treatment, as well as there is increased chances of relapse uh, with uh, if uh, in case of uh, there is isoniazid monoresistance. So this was the study uh, which was done uh, in this uh, BJ Medical College. Uh, it, uh, B B BJ Medical College was a part of this uh, multi-center study for the accuracy of BDMAX uh, multi-drug resistance tuberculosis assay for the detection of uh, MDIDB complex and mutation associated with RIF and isoniosis. So the sensitivity for in this study, uh, it was found that it, it is 93% sensitive and the specificity was 97%. So uh, the overall result suggested that BDMAX assay is a similar platform as compared to the gene expert and offer added advantage of providing INH res uh, resistance upfront as compared to gene expert. And in its conclusion, it was uh, uh, they concluded that there is a need for the new diagnostic tool to combat the global burden of TB. And uh, also, in many high burden settings uh, with a high volume of testing, we need a machine which has a high throughput and uh, this can be achieved with the BDMAX for the rapid detection of both MTB as well as drug resistance. So uh, this is uh, uh, the reagent strip which, uh, which is used in uh, BDMAX. It is a compact and self-contained uh, unitized reagent strip uh, which uh, is highly efficient and uh, it is, it, uh, uh, it, uh, all your PCR and extraction chemistries and pipette tips are contained in this one uh, reagent strip, making it easy to run anywhere between 1 to 24 samples at a time. So even if you, have, uh, if you want to run one or two samples, it can run. It, not, it is not necessary that it should process the 24 samples at a time. Then the assay also, also contains the sample processing control uh, present in the extraction tube, which allows the quality assurance as well. And all these reagents are stable at room temperature, making the inventory management more flexible and convenient. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that in within less than 1.5 minutes hands-on time per specimen, the sample preparation is quick. And uh, 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 after all the sample, all the waste from the extraction process is contained within the strip and can be discarded as per the laboratory sta uh, standard. So there is no uh, uh, issue of uh, waste management. So uh, within, uh, within two to three hours, 24 samples can be run. At the end of eight hours, uh, almost 120 uh, specimens can be run. So the labs who have high throughput, uh, so uh, who have high workload, uh, can uh, can use this uh, uh, machine. And also, uh, this is a walk-away instrument. So once the the sample is in, uh, the the strip is inserted uh, for the processing, we can easily walk away, and then uh, you can get the results in two or three hours. So as I mentioned earlier, it was it's a simplified, efficient, and streamlined workflow, which allows uh, as we, we have to assemble the utilized strip within the rack. That is the snap procedure. Then we have to load this uh, the sample buffer tubes, racks, and PCI cartridge into the, the instrument. And then uh, uh, we have to come back in the average of two to three hours for the results. Uh, so it's a simple walk away test. So apart from MDRTB assay, uh, we also have other assays uh, which are uh, so, uh, gastrointestinal infection for enteric bacterial, extended enteric bacterial, then extended parasitic, extended viral panel. Then we also have uh, respiratory for respiratory, respiratory infections, uh, SARS-CoV-2 reagent, then, then healthcare associated infection for MRSA, uh, then staph uh, cephalococcal resistance, then CDP and CPO, then the, for sexually transmitted infection. Then also in women's health also we have GBF panel as well as vaginal panel. And it uh, is a open system, open system capab capability where we, develop, we can develop our uh, lab develop, de lab develop assay even for the second line MP, uh, uh, second line assays. So it's, uh, it also allows an advantage of mix and match assays. So if you want to uh, run a, a gastrointestinal infection and respiratory infections within a one go, then it can also be done. And it's also easy and convenient to store. Except for MDRTB, uh, uh, which cannot, uh, which does not allow mix and match assays. So this is the max enteric panels which, uh, for the bacterial panel includes Salmonella, Campylobacter, Shigella, and Chica toxin uh, producing E. coli. Then extended bacterial panel includes Yersinia enterocolitica, uh, Vibrio, and uh, enterotoxigenic E. coli. 
scan for the viral panels. Uh, we have noroviral rotavirus panels and also the uh, uh, it also includes adenovirus, apovirus, as well as astrovirus. And then there is the parasite panel. There is the Giardia lamblia, Cryptosporidium, Entamoeba isolitica, and also Max Egypt panel for detection of toxicity of uh, Clostridium difficile. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Questions? Now I request Dr. Ritika to please felicitate uh, Dr. Darshan. all judges and presenters to uh, go to their respective halls. Itiyahe, sir. <laughs>